We're not going to use the D word. The D word, deregulation, is actually a word used by the monopolies to scare people. It makes them think, oh my goodness, no one is going to protect me. Markets are highly regulated. FERC right. has over 200 people in their Office of Enforcement that oversees the markets, ensures that they are regulated, that they operate uh, efficiently, that they operate without fraud and manipulation, and it's done in a way that consumers can feel protected. Hello and welcome to Energy Unplugged by Aurora. This podcast features various experts from Aurora having in-depth conversations with key industry leaders, policymakers and academics from all over the world. It explores the hottest topics across the energy market and gives a unique perspective on major energy issues. Hello and welcome to Aurora Energy Unplugged, coming to you today from Austin, Texas. I'm Oliver Kerr, U.S. Country Lead for Aurora, and I'm really excited for the discussion we have lined up for you this episode. My guest today has a long and illustrious career in the U.S. energy sector. He was the longest serving chairman of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, the FERC, during the Obama administration. He was initially appointed to the FERC by George W. Bush as commissioner in 2006. At FERC, he championed the integration of renewables into the U.S. power grid. Uh, He made a concerted push to enable demand-side response to compete in wholesale power markets, while also being a big proponent of a number of initiatives from opening up the transmission system to more competition, uh, to promoting energy efficiency, and to promoting grid security. All that's on top of a long and successful career as an attorney in the energy sector, in state government, as general counsel of the Nevada Public Utilities Commission and their first ever consumer advocate. And also in the private sector, he's previously held roles at Solar City and is now the chief regulatory officer for Voltus. I'm delighted to welcome my guest today, who is none other than John Wellinghoff. John, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you, Oliver. and Thank you for having me. It's a great uh, pleasure to be able to sit down and talk with you for a while. Great. John, you have an absolutely fascinating career. And before we dive into your time at FERC, which I'm keen to get into, I'm curious about how you got started on this path. I mean, so you trained first as a mathematician. You then did your JD. You practiced as an attorney for many years. I'm curious what led you to the energy sector and to what extent you think that sort of rigorous analytical training in math and in law you know, has impacted the way you've approached and, and tackled the power sector over the years? Well, thank you for the question, Oliver, because it is kind of a, a, an interesting question of how I started out uh, in mathematics. Actually, I, I started out actually as a physics major and changed my major to mathematics. <laughs> um, I always was extremely interested in the natural sciences and uh, in technology. I always had a great interest in technology. And um, and the mathematics side of it, I think, was a good segue into the legal uh, education that I had, because I think you have to have that kind of rigorous um, mm. training in analyzing things, uh, you know, very, very closely and very uh, precisely. Um, and mathematics teaches you how to do that, you know, how to, how to do uh, theorems and proofs and things that, you know, <laughs> teaches you the, the, the logic of, of reasoning and, and understanding an argument and all that kind of came together. Um, and it came together from that uh, to my very early career in, in law. I really started out in law in the energy sector. That was, that was the first job I had was a assistant to the Nevada Public Utilities Commission. I was assistant to one of the commissioners um, and that was a long time ago, longer ago than I want to admit back, <laughs> back in the, back in the mid seventies. And, uh, it was the time of something that a lot of people don't remember the oil, the Arab oil embargo mm-hmm. in the U S and, uh, and at that time, gasoline prices were up to where they are today in the $5 range. And people were waiting in gas lines. And uh, as, as part of that, as, as part of me being a assistant to the uh, Nevada Commission, um, over 18 months that I was with that commission, 
we had more rate cases, more cases for increases in rates by the utility than the commission had seen in the previous 10 years. So I got 10 years of experience in 18 months <laughs> with, with, with utilities. And it kind of, uh, you know, set the stage for the rest of my career, uh, my interest in uh, helping consumers. And that was the other side of it, not only the technology side of, of energy and all the all the technology involved in producing and, and delivering energy that <clears throat> was of interest to me and the, the physics of it, but also the side of assisting consumers and ensuring that their rates can be just and reasonable, that their rates can be, uh, you know, uh, uh, a reasonable rate for uh, the delivery of energy services was something that I always strive for. And also uh, this, the striving for improving efficiency, improving efficiency of the system is something that I was always uh, extremely uh, interested in. So all those things sort of came together and, and got me into, into the career path that I'm, I'm in now. It's really interesting what you say. I mean, do you think the coming of age and sort of cutting your teeth early on in your career during the oil embargo you know obviously energy efficiency has, has been sort of something that you've championed over the years throughout your career is, did that really color your view and and I suppose thinking now to you know what we're seeing in, in, in the oil markets um, you know in response to what's happening in Europe you know are, are we set for another sort of mindset shift in, in how we think about the role of, of things like energy efficiency and and uh, energy security well it did I mean it I mean it it, it, it gave me the idea that there's got to be a better way to do things so people can be more independent can be more efficient they in fact can have the same level of services but do so with using much less energy using energy much more efficiently sm smarter better and and you know that always drove me to you know looking for uh, policy mechanisms and and technology mechanisms that could help consumers do that Mm. And I think you see that actually, I mean, speaking about um, career and, and background and training, it, it certainly feels like the graduates entering the industry today do come from a much broader background than perhaps we saw in the in the 80s and 90s. You, you know, we've probably seen a gradual shift first from you know, engineers to economists as markets liberalized. And now, you know, a much broader skill set, everything from science and technology to computer science, to policy and social science, now that you know decarbonization is such a big challenge. Interesting. So I mean, one of the reasons I think your career is so fascinating is that you spent time at you know, the state policy level, you mentioned Nevada, uh, at the federal policy level, and also in the private sector. I'm curious, what, what do you think is the appropriate role of FERC and the federal government more broadly, I suppose, in the energy transition? Well, I, I think FERC's role as it's evolved from the um, late 90s uh, on to uh, its current role is one of uh, a market uh, overseer to ensure that the markets are operating efficiently and to ensure that the market structures are constructed in ways that help us resolve and solve our policy decisions and our policy desires, those being hopefully decarbonizing our society, decarbonizing the grid. And if we set up a market structure correctly to do that, and it's overseen correctly and operated correctly, I think we can get mm -hmm. there. I think markets have mm -hmm. great power to move consumers in ways that are positive. So. Mm -hmm. That I think is the real function of FERC to be that overseer of that market, to set those market structures, to incorporate those societal policies, and to do so in a way that can achieve those policy ends. Mm. Uh, I, we had Pat Wood, um, another uh, expert chairman on the mm -hmm. on the podcast a few weeks ago, and I think he described it a bit like you know building a house. So the the role of FERC lay a strong foundation, and folks at the state level or RTO level can build on top of that, you've got to be in accordance with uh, the solid foundation that FERC sets. Uh, no, absolutely. And, and Pat actually tried to, to, to establish that foundation when he was chairman of FERC, which was two chairs before me. He tried to set up something called SMD, Standard Market Design. 
And unfortunately, the monopoly utilities in this country uh, pushed back politically so hard against that that he had to he had to retreat from that idea. But I think that idea needs to be resurrected again. I think that idea is one that, um, again, is setting that foundation that's necessary to get us to our societal policy goals that we need to achieve. That it's an interesting point because I think one thing I'm sometimes struck by, particularly as a European, you know, for a country that loves markets, it's quite surprising <laughs> so much power in the US is still bought and sold by regulated monopoly utilities. Well, 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 there was a reason and a purpose for the monopoly uh, utility uh, franchise that was established in the early 1920s in this country, but that's a relic that has to be discarded. It's a relic that has to, we have to move on from. And if we don't move on from it, it's going to inhibit us to achieve these goals. It really is going to stop us from decarbonizing our society. If we don't structure these as a market structure that will allow those societal goals to be incorporated in those markets and um, because uh, unfortunately, these individual monopolies have too much self-interest to see the bigger picture of the overall societal interest that we need to move forward towards. But I think a market structure can instead help us move towards that uh, societal goal of decarbonization much quicker. Is that the direction of travel towards more deregulated markets? First of all, Oliver, I'm going to stop you. We're not, gonna, we're, we're not gonna use the D word because the D word is the D word deregulation is actually a word used by the monopolies to scare people. Mm. And it does scare people because it it makes them think, oh my goodness, no one is going to protect me. Um, mm -hmm. markets are highly regulated. FERC right. has over 200 people in their office of enforcement that oversees the markets, ensures that they are regulated, that they operate uh, efficiently, that they operate without fraud and manipulation, and it's done in a way that consumers can feel protected. So to the extent that we go to restructuring, I would call it restructuring from a monopoly uh, uh, retail and in part wholesale structure to a, a, um, a, a market structure, uh, that ultimately provides for markets both at the wholesale and retail level. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we need to do that as rapidly as possible. FERC is, is, is moving that in that direction on the wholesale level. There are now seven uh, individual wholesale markets in the U.S. There's one in Texas, ERCOT, and there's six more that uh, uh, FERC oversees. And, and FERC is, is working, and I, I worked when I was at FERC as chairman, and FERC continues to work to expand those. They're looking to expand the market throughout the Western United States, where there isn't a wholesale market uh, fully now, except in California. And they're also working to expand the market in the southeastern part of the United States, where no market exists in Florida and the, and the Carolinas and, and Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi. Uh, there's really no uh, effective independent wholesale market there either. So we need to expand the wholesale markets in those locations. And then we need to also expand the retail markets like there are retail choice in Texas mm -hmm. um, in, in, in the uh, major metropolitan areas of Houston and Dallas-Fort Worth. Uh, those areas all have retail competitive markets where consumers can choose retail choice. There are also uh, some monopolies in Texas that are primarily municipal monopolies like the city of Austin, uh, Austin Energy, and also in San Antonio is a municipal utility. Um, but again, there should be choice of consumers there with respect to be able uh, to have self-generation of rooftop solar, uh, to have the ability to uh, sell out in the wholesale market um, load flexibility or demand response um, and self-generation if, if you have um, self-generation as well or um, battery storage. All those things should be options for consumers, even in the areas where they have uh, a municipal power system. So we have to give consumers more choice at all mm -hmm. levels. Residential, um, commercial, and industrial consumers need more choice uh, at the retail level and also 
have the ability to participate in wholesale markets. And we need to expand those wholesale markets across the entire United States uh, so that you know, FERC can ensure that those markets are properly structured and overseen in ways that can get us to our societal goals of decarbonizing the grid. I think you, you rightly mentioned sort of the push towards more integration. You know, there's the Western balancing markets, um, you know, some similar efforts in the South, the Southeast. What, what's holding further market structuring back? You know, if, if we look back in 2030, do you think, you know, the, there was a, beyond the seven markets you mentioned, do you think the, the rest of that 40% of megawatt hours will be traded on, on competitive wholesale markets or will we still in the world of, of vertically integrated utilities? No, I think it will. I think it will go into competitive markets because uh, the the pressure is too strong, and the pressure comes from two two areas. The pressure is on a financial perspective because there's so much money to be saved. There's so much inefficiency in these markets that are not independent now. They're just simply bilateral trades between consum- between uh, uh, monopoly utilities um, and. And the inefficiencies are so high, and the savings are in the billions of dollars for consumers. We're seeing that in the – you mentioned the energy imbalance market in the West. We're seeing that now in that energy imbalance market. They're saving literally billions of dollars by participating in this energy imbalance market, which is not a full market. It has some aspects of a market, but but it's not a full independent market yet. And they, they're moving towards a full independent market there because there's so much money – on the table to be picked up to provide to consumers to put in their pockets. So there is tremendous political pressure and tremendous consumer pressure to go there. And the second reason that these independent markets are so important is the integration of renewables and the decarbonization of the grid. And we're seeing that as well. Uh, You know, areas that have independent markets like PJM um, and ERCOT, uh, you're seeing tremendous amounts of integration of renewables, SBP uh, uh, in Oklahoma and um, in Kansas and those areas. Um, and those integration of those renewables happens because you do have an independent grid operator who operates not only the market, but also does the independent planning on the system that allows for the interconnection of these renewables into the system and helps that integration into the system. So, so ultimately, we're going to have much faster uh, uh, decarbonization, much faster uh, adoption of renewables uh, if we do have an independent market system throughout this country. Uh, and so you're seeing those two drivers, I think, push that. And I think you will push that to the point where by 2030, there'll be independent markets everywhere. Mm. I mean, to some extent, it feels quite like some of these conversations are, uh, are at least to some degree quite ideological. Um, so despite the pressures, um, you know, on, on the cost saving side, on the you know, integration of renewable side uh, and just general market efficiency, you know, we, we still have um, you know, a lot of the country not in competitive wholesale markets, but but at the same time, I mean, you you were appointed by, uh, you know, George Bush in two thousand and six uh, as a FERC commissioner. You were then appointed chairman by President Obama. You know, there have been some pretty landmark policy battles fought in FERC over the years. You know, many of them, I, I'm sure, in, in your tenure. And could you comment on the role of, of politics or ideology in, in sort of federal or FERC policy making and you know, is this something that you've seen changed over time, you know, particularly as decarbonization becomes a, a more pressing issue? Well, <laughs> it, it kind of goes back and forth. I mean, we recently had a hearing uh, before the uh, Senate Energy and Environment Committee, uh, chaired by Senator Joe Manchin from, from mm. uh, West Virginia, where they were excoriating uh, three members of FERC, the three it happened to be the three Democratic members of FERC who voted for a new uh, policy statement to incorporate a review of uh, carbon uh, into the uh, the review of, of new gas pipelines, um, mm-hmm. and they were and, and they were um, a number of the senators uh, were extremely exercised by that. Uh, policy statement that FERC had issued, and and ultimately, uh, you know, it, it was was a matter of politics because because yeah. you know I think what FERC did was the right thing. Ultimately, uh, yeah. they were they were trying to comply with a federal court order that was ordering them to in fact uh, re- review uh, carbon in their 
uh, analysis, their environmental impact analysis, new pipelines. And so, um, you know, the politics can go back and forth, but fortunately, FERC is an independent uh, federal agency. It's an independent regulatory agency that the uh, FERC commissioners appointed for term appointments. And it's very mm-hmm. difficult to remove a commissioner. They're in for a five-year term. And and usually uh, the FERC commissioners act uh, independent of politics. And I think that's a good thing. I mean, we've seen that with both Republican and Democratic commissioners. You saw that under Commissioner uh, Chairman Chatterjee, who had great mm-hmm. pressure from the, uh, from the Department of Energy. Uh, from Secretary Perry to incorporate uh, into uh, his rulemaking more uh, consideration of, of, of coal power plants. And FERC resisted that because they, they, mm-hmm. they didn't see how that f- fit into their uh, overall mission, didn't see how that fit into their statutory responsibilities. And, you know, a Republican chair r- resisted pressure from, from a Republican administration to do something that was just wrong from a policy perspective. So... Mm-hmm. You know, FERC can act independently, should act independently, and, and act in, in the best interests of, of the country uh, under the authority that it has, the Federal Power Act and the Natural Gas Act, uh, and, and, it, and it, it seems to continue to do so. I think that's an important point, and it's one of the nice things about having an independent agency, and, and maybe to not overwork the, the House metaphor, but you could have different administrations come in and and the politics swing and, you know, you could change the, you know, the decor of the house, but you don't want to be ripping up the foundation. uh, Right, right. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I I think that's a very good analogy. um, So I'm just curious, looking back, you know, with the benefit of hindsight now, um, at the legacy you you have from FERC, are are there any things you're particularly proud of or, or, or anything perhaps that you wish you'd done differently? Um, with the benefit of hindsight? Well, I, I am proud of the fact that we did, you know, make the point and made it all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court that consumers can participate in markets and that FERC has yeah. oversight over doing that, um, that, that, you know, consumers have the ability to provide load flexibility or demand response into markets. And that was what was, what was challenged um, in order 745 that was supported uh-huh. and, and sustained by the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, and that and that FERC is the primary entity to oversee and ensure that those consumers can participate in those markets. And FERC, you know, then has gone further with its order 2222 uh, after uh-huh. I left, uh, which they issued a couple of years back, that now uh, looks to incorporate all consumer. Uh, resources, all demand side products, including not only load flexibility, but uh, distributed uh, generation, uh, battery storage, even EV uh, electric vehicles, all those resources can in fact provide services into the grid. I mean, just look at this one statistic. By 2030, it's estimated that there'll be 22 million electric vehicles in the U.S. Those 22 million electric vehicles, the battery capacity in those vehicles will be more than the capacity of all the electric generating plants in the U.S. currently. Wow. Huge. So, if you, so, so, so if you look at, yeah, look at the potential of utilizing those vehicles that are sitting idle for 20 plus hours a day, I mean, it's, it's tremendous. And, and so we have to ensure that we can effectively incorporate those resources into the grid and use them as a positive thing to achieve our, our societal goals of decarbonizing mm. the grid. Uh, that brings us quite nicely, actually, to your current role for Voltus. I mean, you have a huge reputation in the power sector. You, you really could have gone on to do anything. I'm curious, what made you decide to dedicate um, you know, your time and energy at this part of your career to, to Voltus and, and what they're doing? Well, I, I saw a dedicated group of individuals who had a vision. And the vision was that the consumer side of the meter has those resources that can, in fact, be a major, major player in decarbonizing the grid. And they're setting up the platform to do that. They have the platform to allow for this translation between consumer resources and the markets. Someone has to take those resources, aggregate them, accumulate them together, 
provide the communications and telemetry platform necessary to translate them into markets that effectively provide for those market services. Voltus can do that. Uh, Voltus is doing that. In fact, Voltus is doing that in every market in the U.S. and Canada today. Um, and so, you know, I, I saw that vision and I saw the, saw the the quality of the individuals in the company, and it was just something that I wanted to join. I wanted to be part of, and I and it, and it was a continuation of what I did way back, you know, in 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 2011 with with Order 745, ensuring the demand response could be part of uh, an overall uh, market resource uh, under FERC. And I wanted to make sure that we could expand upon that in order 2222 and mm -hmm. ensure that consumers can play that part of the market that uh, can ensure we have uh, a, a decarbonized, uh, low carbon system in this country that can achieve our global goals of, of, of reducing global warming. Mm, right, because I, I think the traditional way of, of thinking about power systems, uh, and certainly I, I think I'm guilty of, of this at some times, is, is, you know, load is fixed. You've got a certain number of megawatts that you need to supply in each hour, and all the action is on the supply side. But, you know, particularly you mentioned EVs, you know, the push for electrification more broadly, that, that assumption of fixed load, fixed demand certainly no longer holds. Um, and enabling demand side participation feels important. Um, and I think we can agree that, you know, the potential is, is huge. Demand yeah. is, is extremely flexible and it's getting more flexible all the time because we're, you know, we started with in Voltus is, you know, started with uh, commercial industrial customers, but we're working our way all the way down to now small, small commercial customers and, and all the way down to residential customers that are now having the controls and communication capability within their homes and small businesses to fully participate as a full member of the grid and provide significant resources to that grid. You're looking at not only load flexibility, but you're looking at, you know, millions of homes that have rooftop solar. Mm -hmm. Millions of homes that are going to have batteries, millions of homes that are going to have batteries, not only stationary storage, like I had two Tesla power walls in my garage in, in Berkeley, California, where I was for a number of years and, and, mm -hmm. and could be independent on the grid, but they're going to have these EV vehicles that have even bigger capacity than stationary storage that can be used as a resource so so ultimately you know the capabilities are increasing on a on a daily basis with new technology and uh new uh resources that are going into into consumers homes so so there's certainly new technologies um at, at the same time i feel like we we've had at least some of the basic building block blocks um you know at least on the technology side for a little while I know I think you led a big push for the smart meter deployment over a decade ago now, but despite that, I think it's probably fair to say that in demand side response remains a relatively small part of the energy mix in the US as a whole. Uh, why do you think we haven't seen more progress over the years? Well, I think in part because we have not seen, you know, the regulatory structure that we need, and that's Mm. And that was in part when we started with Set Order 745, but we're moving now to a much more comprehensive structure under Order 2222 of FERC. And that's why that order is so important. In fact, that order right now, all the all the independent wholesale markets, the six of them under FERC, are having to submit compliance plans to FERC of how they're going to comply with the order. And Voltus is very involved in ensuring that those compliant plans Compliance plans are robust, open, transparent, and uh, effective to allow consumers to effectively participate. So that's one reason. The other reason is, is, is you know, we're still seeing pushback from the monopoly utilities. The monopoly utilities do not want to uh, provide for consumers' participation in these wholesale markets. They see this as a threat to their business model. They see this as something that somehow will uh, disrupt, you know, their historical and traditional way of doing business and we have to move away from that historical way of doing business because we have to recognize that consumers do have this flexibility and that they do have this need to participate in the grid ultimately because by doing so they can lower their costs and mm -hmm. they can also decarbonize the grid at the same time and those are things that you know consumers you know any surveys that you you look at number one consumers want you know 
energy services at the lowest cost. But number two, you know, there's a very high uh, consumer demand for solar energy. There's a very high consumer interest in decarbonizing the grid and, and doing what they can to reduce global warming. And so, you know, we have these monopoly utilities that unfortunately keep pushing back on this and we have to restructure this system so that we again have uh, retail uh, competition and we have full uh, wholesale uh, market independence as well. For anyone who hasn't been following this super closely, FERC Order 2222 was a rule that uh, enabled distributed energy resource aggregators to compete in wholesale power markets. It, it allows for and, and ensures that we can increase the amount of distributed resources that participate in markets by allowing for market participation by all resource classes behind the meter, energy storage, distributed generation, demand response flexibility, uh, demand flexibility, uh, and any types of, of controls on that flexibility that can be incorporated and aggregated together under 2222 can and should be allowed to participate in market products, all the market products that are there, energy capacity and entry services mm. on an equal basis. To what extent the, the potential to demand side response to be fully realized, do you need some sort of uh, you know, local price signal on the load side? You need no price signal on the load side because ulti ultimately what you need is the consumer's ability to, to receive revenue from mm. selling these products into the market. You, do, you don't need price signals on, 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 the, on, the, on, the, on the energy side ultimately. I mean, and, and, and that, I think historically we can see is never going to happen on a widespread basis. I mean, there have, have been many efforts to put in time of use pricing and other, mm -hmm. other price, price signals to consumers, mm -hmm. you know, that is the stick. We, we don't need the stick. What we need is the carrot. The carrot is paying consumers to do the right thing, paying them to sell in their, their load flexibility, paying them to sell in their, own distributed generation, paying them to sell in their battery storage uh, capabilities, ultimately. And that is the carrot side of it. And, and, and consumers respond much better to carrots than they do sticks. Everybody can res responds to, to, to carrots much better. And so that's what Voltus is doing, providing consumers with carrots. Um, and, and, and ultimately, uh, do, doing so in a way uh, that they can do it you know, transparently and uh, in a way that does not disrupt their own operations, whether it be a, a steel mill, whether it be a Walmart, whether it be an individual consumer in their home, uh, they can still have all the energy services they need and all the uses they need, but at the same time, they can make money from those resources by selling those, uh, those resources into the grid. It's definitely interesting on the, the point around carrots and sticks. I'm just thinking back to the storm in, in Texas in February of last year. You know, Texas has a competitive retail market, like you say. I think before the storm, a number of suppliers um, were, you know, very popular providing uh, customers with variable rate tariffs that, that track the wholesale price. Um, you know, people thought they were great. They saved money until <laughs> yeah. you have, uh, <laughs> until you yeah. have a, a yes. February event. Prices were yes. nine thousand for um, a week. But and, you know, but if if but if Texas was paying them on the carrot side, if they were paying them to reduce their usage, it would have mitigated significantly the effects of that storm. It could have, in fact, uh, prevented uh, potentially uh, part of those blackouts uh, if, in fact, they had a more robust program to pay consumers to reduce their consumption. Mm. Do you think it's possible to reach net zero with a combination of renewables, you know, efficiency, demand side response, or will we also need you know, new investment in other supply side generation like you know, look, uh, nuclear, CCS, hydrogen, long duration storage? I, I think it is possible to uh, achieve net zero with renewables and then combinations of uh, battery storage, certainly. Um, at the local level and at a higher grid level as well on, bo on both sides, and also a load flexibility and distributed generation like rooftop solar as well, uh, but uh, renewables on both sides of the meter, 
uh, battery storage on both sides of the meter, load flexibility. Um, I, I think I think the capability is there. In fact, I know I know RMI Rocky Mountain Institute has done an analysis on Texas, for example, to show that it could be done uh, in the state of Texas. So even even in a you know in not in an average year, but even in a storm event where people, I mean, is there a certain amount of demand that is just inflexible and and you you know you can't you can't reduce load to zero. The power needs to come from somewhere, and and if the wind sure. farms, yeah. Sure, but uh, but you know, but the, but those wind farms in Texas, you know, <laughs> they have wind farms in Minnesota, mm-hmm. and those wind farms in Minnesota operate during you know mm-hmm. sub-zero conditions. So the wind farms mm-hmm. in Texas that didn't operate in those sub-zero conditions can be weatherized. I mean, there's there's ways to make these things operate certainly, and ensure that they're reliable, and sure that. And I and I'm and certainly it wasn't the first of all. Let me make it clear: it wasn't the wind farms that caused yeah. the blackout in Texas. It was the gas plants in Texas that weren't properly weatherized ultimately, uh, and the and the gas wellheads. I mean, we did a report in 2011 when when Texas had a uh, an outage then. Uh, uh, and and we made recommendations that Texas didn't follow with respect to weatherization of its gas power plants at the time. So ultimately, it was it was the, it was the gas system that failed uh, in Texas to provide uh, ad- adequate reliability. Uh, but but again, you can you can you can sufficiently weatherize and make reliable uh, these renewable systems. Uh, you can reduce load uh, as required. You can have sufficient battery storage. Uh, for backup. I mean, all these things uh, taken together can ultimately get us to net zero, I believe. Mm. And what's the role of networks in all of this? I mean, I think it's quite clear that you know, more electrification, more renewables means that we will need huge investment in grid infrastructure over the coming decades. Yes, yes. Do you think the US is capable of building out the network that it needs? Well, um, it's it's only capable if, if if I think the federal government, you know, takes the bull by the horn, so to speak, and starts doing some interregional and and national planning on uh, a a large uh, uh, high voltage network system because we do have to have exchanges between areas obviously there's going to be one area that you know may be subject to storms or subject to uh you know for whatever reason reductions in output of its of its renewable generation and another area can supplant it uh, if we have sufficient interconnections between those regions but we don't now we don't have those those kind of connections we need connections across the country um, you know, these were, were you know, uh, grid analyses that I did back when I was at, at FERC by, uh, you know, my staff put together uh, a proposal for a high voltage uh, uh, DC system uh, across the U.S. that ultimately would uh, provide for inter- interconnections and, and exchanges between regions. And we need to move on that, but it can only be done at the federal level. And, and right now, unfortunately, we have, you know, a Congress that can't seem to uh, to move forward on, on any significant uh, legislation. Uh, so, so I think we can do it, yes, but we have to have, you know, the will to do it and the direction to do it uh, from the federal government. It, it sounds like um, you're not super hopeful on Build Back Better getting passed anytime soon. Well, you know, I'm always hopeful. I want to, want to continue <laughs> to be, be an optimist to the last breath. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, it, it, it's been a, a long number of, of, of months here that we've been trying to move forward with the Build Back Better. We do have the infrastructure bill passed, but mm-hmm. the Build Back Better portion of it is, is critical, too. Uh, and so I'm I'm ho- I'm very hopeful that uh, there can be a compromise and we can we can move forward with that. Um, on a related note to grid infrastructure, just on the I, I saw you recently on um, CBS's 60 Minutes, and and people should definitely go and check it out if if they haven't already. Uh, and you were speaking about the vulnerability of the you know, physical grid infrastructure to um, yes. you know, to attack to attack. I mean, does does demand side response? Um, do you think it reduces that risk or the smart grid more broadly, or, or does it also introduce more risks in a more you know, internet enabled connected system? Well, a- a- anytime we have consumers at a local level utilizing more of their resources, you know, behind the meter, it's going to 
also make the grid more reliable. It's going to reduce uh, the um, possibility of um, cascading blackouts, uh, but, but we'd still need to do more uh, at the larger level. We still need to do more uh, hardening the grid and, and more uh, in this issue of, again, uh, the building of high voltage transmission lines, primarily DC lines that can, can island regions of the country uh, so we don't have uh, the potential for cascading blackouts across an entire interconnect as we do now. Uh, and, 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 and so that would serve two purposes by putting in that high voltage DC uh, system. It would, it would in, in regional areas, it would number one, allow for these transfers of large amounts of renewables across the country so that you know one, one area could support another area and, and help our decarbonization goals, but it would also help with this issue of reliability uh, and, and uh, physical security ensuring that you know we don't have massive cascading blackouts across the entire region like we had you know in the 2003 blackout across the northeast mm. uh, you know and some of the other blackouts that the country's experienced great and you know in addition to the man-made cause threat as i think texas reminded us that we have to also remind remind ourselves of the threats that come from nature uh, as well if Texas was strongly interconnected in the rest of the United States, it wouldn't have had the blackout. It mm -hmm. wouldn't have happened because, because other regions could have supported Texas at that time. Mm -hmm. And, that's, an, and that's, that's, that's simply an artifact of politics where Texas doesn't want to be strongly interconnected because if they would be strongly interconnected, they would be under FERC's jurisdiction and they don't want to be under FERC's jurisdiction. But perhaps Texas independence is quite a good note to, to end on here. Well, so as our listeners will know, we typically end our podcast with a quick fire round of under or overrated, where I'll throw out a bunch of concepts at you and you'll tell me if you think they are under or overrated relative to market consensus. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so the first one is the role of markets in decarbonizing the power sector. Oh, way, or way, 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 way underrated. Way, way underrated. I thought, I thought that based on our earlier discussion. Interesting. Good. Uh, the second is the need for investment in dispatchable generation in the United States. Uh, I think that's overrated. Mm. And finally, the U.S.'s ability to hit net zero emissions across the economy, not just power, by 2050. I think that is um, overrated. Uh, interesting. Can you expand on that a little? I think there's some, a lot of a lot of challenges. One we talked about was the federal government getting behind, uh, you know, a national transmission grid, a large HVDC grid, and and moving that forward. I mean, that's you know, that's a big lift. Uh, to get done in that period of time, and and I think that's one of, one of the gating factors to get there. And the other gating factor is the expansion of these markets, both on a retail yeah. and wholesale level. Now we're doing better there on the wholesale level. Retail uh, is not moving as quickly as it, I think it, I think it should. Retail markets, um, but again, those are big lifts as well. So we've got a lot, a lot of work to do. We got a lot of work to do. We do indeed. And John Wellinghoff, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the podcast today. Well, it's been a pleasure to, to talk to you, Oliver. Thank you very much. That was Oliver Kerr, US country lead for Aurora, talking to John Wellinghoff, former FERC chairman and current chief regulatory officer at Voltus. Do keep an eye on our podcast feed for more in-depth conversations with senior members of the energy industry. The best way to do this is to subscribe on whatever platform you use. Thanks for listening and goodbye.